Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for the organizers for inviting me here. It's my first time at KITP, and it's wonderful, uh, especially one of the first conferences in person. So, um, as introduced, I'm going to talk about universal dynamics and non thermal fixed points. And I usually uh, like to start with a paraphrasing a quote from Bill Phillips um, that he gave at the FQMT in 2019 in Prague, which usually increases in controversy uh, the more theorists are in the room. So um, if you cannot measure it, it's not physics. So uh, make of it what you want. Um, I'm going to talk about it in the context of many body physics. So for me, I was always thinking about it. Um, we start. Uh, let's say, uh, with one bird, quantum bird, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's relatively simple to describe. Uh, we go to a few, it becomes a little bit more complicated. Um, but then we go to many of them, thousands, a couple of thousands. And uh, if we think about how to describe the systems, um, the macroscopic properties of the system become less relevant. So formulating the system in form of eigenstates or something might be theoretically well suited, but the complexity of this many body state prevents to be measured in all details. So I cannot even measure it. So the question is, uh, do we have better ways to formulate this in actually observable quantities? And then we come usually to correlations. And if we measure all the correlations, so any quantum field theory is completely determined by its correlations. So, uh, yeah, so if we measure all these correlations, can we define suitable models that describe everything we can actually see in experiment, which then brings us to, for example, randomization group, where we can say we have an insensitivity to microscopic details uh, that naturally emerge in these systems and prevents us from actually seeing all the details. So uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of a broader definition of universality, and in the context over the last years, what we did in the lab of Jörg Schmidtmeier, uh, it's a lot in the context of analog quantum simulators. So what can we learn about fundamental processes by looking at, for example, cold atom systems? So I always like to give this little chart of connections. So for me, for example, quantum field theories that we can study in theory, uh, we can look in the lab, and often those are then emergent or effective quantum field theory descriptions of many body systems. And it's a question, how well do they describe? What can we actually learn about the system? So we have other universal properties, so preheating, Kibizurek, uh, so it's usually in the sense of uh, equilibrium universality classes, critical exponents. We have, for example, false vacuum decay, which is first order phase transition, uh, general relativity in a very simplified way uh, in the sense of analog gravity. Um, I want to classify as non-trivial geometry, so quantum field theory and curved space times. Then we have a lot of physics with black holes, inflation, unradiation, which is connected to horizons. So as soon as we set up an analog horizon in the system, we can study properties of these. And there's other, lots of other uh, properties like defects, phases of matter, which have to do with symmetry topology. So um, what I'm going to talk about in this 30-minute talk is I'm going to tell you a little bit about cooling quenches we did on our atom chip setup, um, and then talk about two experiments, one about Kibizurek mechanism, which is for me connected to short time dynamics after the quench, uh, then non thermal thick points, which is intermediate time scales, up to relaxation of the system. And then I'm going to show some very preliminary results, actually, from this weekend on scaling dynamics in helium star condensation. And then I'm going to post some open questions. OK, so first, a little bit about the setup. Um, so what we usually use are these atom chips, which are integrated circuits for what we call quantum matter. Um, they're very nice. They're very tight. They're very stable. So you produce uh, magnetic traps. Usually, you have a weakly confined longitudinal direction and two tightly confined radial, radial directions. So most of the condensates we're interested in or working on is in the quasi-one-dimensional limit. 
which means that uh, the temperature and chemical potential are smaller than the first, than uh, the energy gap of the radially excited state. So radially, we're in the ground state, and longitudinally, we have a multi-mode system, so it's quad L1D. Uh, in this talk, this will always be a harmonic potential. Um, right now, we have one experiment that already has it, another one that's gonna be implemented. Uh, if you combine these atom chips with DMDs, so you can uh, then do potential painting um, for the atoms and correct for any inhomogeneities in the trapping potential, and especially you can do flat bottom potentials, which in theory is always much nicer than having a harmonic trap in the system. Now um, to the cooling quenches. So what do we do? We start with a 3D thermal gas just above uh, the critical temperature. So it has a lot of transversally excited state. So R is now just a radial direction. Uh, we leave the system a while since it's nicely, until it's nicely thermalized. And then we just very quickly ramp down the transverse uh, potential, allowing high energy atoms to quickly leave the trap. Uh, we hold it for a very short time and afterwards quench the potential up again, effectively closing the system. So as you can see here, we're actually lowering this trap or opening this trap under the first transversely excited states. So we're very rapidly quenching the system to a 1D situation where only the radial ground state is occupied. And once we close the trap, it's practically 1D. Uh, afterwards, we have look at the unitary evolution of these isolated systems. And um, what we will study is dynamics of the phase transition, the far from equilibrium dynamics that follows this quench, and in the long time the evolution, the relaxation of an isolated system isolated will be, really, um, yeah. uh, we talk about isolated afterwards. So this is one goal. Um, and in general, we expect these systems to reach at, in a long time limit, some thermal quasi condensate state. Uh, and this is now exactly the question, how does the system reach thermal equilibrium again? Uh, a little bit to what we can measure or what we generally measure in in cold atom experiments. So commonly, and I can't go into the detail of continuous measurements, which is a very interesting topic, but commonly uh, we use destructive measurements. So we initialize the system, we let it evolve for a while, we switch off the traps and we take a picture. So the best we can do is we can measure every constituent, so the position of every constituent and potentially their internal states. So uh, it means we start with an experiment we take an image, and what we can do now is we can take some unitary operation in between, uh, which lets us access different properties of the system. So for example, if we just take a picture of the system as it is, we say in Z2, we get the position of each atom as it was in the experiment. Uh, other experiments where we did a lot was in double well potentials, where you can look at interference of two condensates, where you can measure the phase, and we did a lot uh, of emergent models and measuring uh, one particle irreducible correlations in the sine gordon model. So if you're interested in this, uh, please talk to me. Um, and what's gonna be most interesting for this talk now is you can do a time of flight measurement. So it's just a free evolution. And here 1D actually helps us. The system expands very rapidly in the radial direction. It dilutes, it becomes practically non-interacting. So we have a free evolution, and we measure this in a light sheet after 46 milliseconds time of flight. And this has single atom sensitivity, so each dot here is an atom. Um, and with this, we then rapidly converge to the momentum distribution. So for a finite time of flight, you will always have in the infrared a region where you don't really see momentum space. But what you can do is you can uh, add some hydrodynamic velocity profile uh, and do condensate focusing. So basically it's like a lens which brings the focus point to a finite distance, here a finite time of flight, which then enables measurement of momenta in the infrared. Okay, now uh, first a very, very crude uh, introduction to Kibizurek. So uh, what is, what do I mean with Kibizurek? So we have uh, critical slowing down near a second order phase transition is very well common. It's uh, equilibrium universality. 
So uh, relaxation times as well as correlation length diverge as we approach the critical temperature. And if we now want to cool a system in a finite time or we want to cross the space transition in a finite time, uh, the system will inevitably depart at some point from thermal equilibrium and we start come uh, near this critical point when the correlation length or the relaxation time diverges and uh, we will have some non-equilibrium state. Now, in the broken symmetry phase, or the broken symmetry phase, the order parameter is now chosen locally, and for transition at a finite rate, causality limits establishment of coherence over large scales. So we start out with something that has zero order parameter, we quench over the phase transition. Now, depending on the rate that we quench, uh, causality tells us, or the sonic horizon in cold atom experiments, tells us that uh, I can only have a finite size where coherence can be established. And in between this, uh, these different patches, I will in general have the inflation of, of defects. So it can be topological. In our case, they're rather quasi-topological because in 1D, both gases, it's gonna be solitons, which continuously can be deformed into the ground state. So uh, if you do the calculation um, and extend it to inhomogeneous systems, which we have, uh, you can say that you can predict the defect density uh, and S that you have if you cross the phase transition, so the critical temperature at a finite rate RQ. And as you can see, it's a sort of simple power law with some exponents, which are defined by the equilibrium critical exponents of the system. Okay. Now, uh, how do we count these defects? So as I already said, it's not topological defects. So um, for us, these defects can be continuously deformed into the ground state. So a soliton is a local density suppression connected with a phase slip. And this phase slip can be any value between zero and pi. So counting these defects is very, very uh, uh, subjective. So where do you set the cutoff? What do you call a soliton, what not? Uh, usually in experiment, this also requires some additional waiting time where additional uh, cooling, where the system is open, there's lots of nonlinear dynamics going on, and usually these defects will decay until they have some density that you can actually measure in an experiment. And this is actually exactly the dynamics we're interested in. So a better way to measure these defects is to do it through some correlation measures. It can either be the correlation length directly, or in our case, it will be the momentum distribution. And uh, most importantly, this enables us to measure the defect density immediately following the quench. So we don't have to insert a waiting time, we don't have to insert an additional cooling. And for the case of solitons, uh, we have developed this so-called, we call it random defect model. So it's just uh, randomly distributed defects. And okay, this is a lot of math. Uh, so you have some background distribution, which can be the inhomogeneous bulk, it can be the additional temperature, and then you have some momentum distribution part that comes from the solitonic defects, which can be split in to a local part of the density suppression and uh, uh, another part of the phase slips. And this phase slips, we can now calculate first order coherence function, which depends on the phase slips and probability distribution of uh, the solitons in, in something like a phase space for solitons, where Z is the position and nu is the velocity of the soliton. So in the simplest case, uh, we can solve this analytically, and we get uh, this momentum distribution, where the first part is a Lorentzian, which is defined by the mean defect density. So we can say, see, in a double logarithmic plot, we have the mean distances between these solitons, and then we get a power law, which is k to the minus two, which might worry you, because it's exactly the same as we get for a quasi-condensate. So how do we distinguish this from a thermal state? And here actually the second part comes in, which is the local density suppression connected to this phase slip. And if you look at high momenta, you can see that it's exponentially decaying and it's actually going like e to the minus k, which is different than a thermal state where Boltzmann would be e to the minus k squared. And you see that you have this characteristic cutoff, which is uh, now the width of the defect, which in thermal equilibrium or in, let's, let's call it an equilibrium soliton is fixed by the healing length of the system but which here I will leave as a free parameter for now. Okay, so uh, we're now doing, uh, we now start 
with the system, as I described, above the critical temperature. Then we ramp down the potential with a finite rate. So from one kilohertz per millisecond to 25 kilohertz per millisecond. And look at the evolution afterwards. So t equals zero is always the point when we close the trap again and the system evolves isolated. Um, and what you can see, so actually what I can tell you that the particle number here from smaller quench rates to higher quench rate actually goes down. But you can see that the width uh, in momentum and in, uh, in position and momentum, so this is just the density, the lower panel is the momentum distribution, actually increases. So we have a system that's driven further and further away from equilibrium. So uh, what we can do, you can also see that due to the harmonic potential, we get for slower quenches a breathing amplitude, which is this highly widened condensate, which then starts to collapse under the harmonic potential. And we can utilize this to do self-focusing um, or use self-focusing effects in time of flight. So this breathing amplitude gives us a hydrodynamic velocity profile. And if we switch the trap off at the right point, we will exactly have this focusing condition and can measure the infrared momentum distribution. And here are some examples of these momentum distributions with this random defect fits. So uh, we see for very low quench rates, uh, these fits don't work that well, which is mainly a reason of this enormous breathing uh, excitation we have. So as you will also see later, errors usually get very big in this regime. And this is why we want to, in the next step, uh, go to flat bottom potentials. But once uh, we reach um, higher quench rates, it actually becomes very well defined. And we see how the system approaches more and more. So here you can just make out a K to the minus two with some imagination. And you can see that the defect density actually increases. So some other analysis to convince you that what we see are actually solitons. So we can, for one, uh, look at this broadening in real space and in momentum space a little bit more in detail. So for real space, we now make a scaling ansatz with some scaling parameter B of T. This is the usual thing to do when you have a breathing excitation in the system. And we can then uh, look at the mean uh, width of this cloud as compared to what we would expect if the system would be in thermal equilibrium. And we can see that this increases with the quench rate, which makes sense. Uh, so the black line, for example, is simply saying, if I have a soliton in the system, it displaces some atoms so my system, by my density distribution will get wider. And I already here, you see, I already put in some scaling form and it fits relatively well. Uh, the same in the momentum distribution. And here we measure it actually at the focus point. So this is where we best see the infrared momentum distribution. And you can also see that the width of the momentum distribution increases and it's proportional to the quench rate and these small deviations can actually be explained by saturation of the random defect model. Uh, another thing um, we found is uh, if you look at the frequencies of these oscillations, so if you go to very low quench rates, uh, so the dashed line is just the oscillation in real space. And if we look at momentum space, so it's an interacting system. So we see frequency doubling, which was predicted or is known to happen because of self-reflection of the cloud uh, at, at the compression. Um, but now if we increase the quench rate, uh, we see this transition from this frequency doubling, which is expected in thermal equilibrium, to no doubling and just an out-of-phase oscillation uh, of the momentum distribution to for even higher quench rates, where the momentum distribution basically doesn't see uh, the harmonic potential anymore, and we just end up with something that is relatively stiff at the beginning and then slowly starts to decay. So uh, we can actually understand this since uh, dark solitons have repulsive, uh, repulsive interactions. Um, so here we can then think of that solitons are not 
there's not that many solitons, so they don't significantly alter the dynamics from thermal equilibrium. Whereas here, uh, we have a relatively large number of defects, so their interaction actually leads to the fact that if I compress the gas, compressing these solitons costs more energy than, uh, than kinetic energy you gain from the harmonic potential. And here, these solitons absolutely dominate, so you cannot compress the gas anymore. Okay. Okay, so how, how am I doing on time, actually? Uh, Okay, uh, that should work. Okay, so uh, now we can um, do this analysis for all these quenches, and we can look at the mean defect density over quench rate for different quench rates. And I'm plotting here um, some different observables, just uh, that we can see that this analysis actually makes sense. So the red dots are always taken at the first best focus point within the first half of the breathing period. So it's the earliest time where we see most of the momentum distribution. So this should be uh, the most reliable result that actually tells us the momentum distribution. Uh, compared, we can just take the mean and standard deviation of the full evolution and see that, okay, we get a slight offset. As I said, with this breathing period, it's not that easy. Um, but it's not uh, significantly different. You see that for small quench rates, we get a very large error bar, which is due to this enormous breathing period we have. And if we now look at these two different, so the black one corresponds to the red dots, blue one corresponds to the blue, and we look at the scaling exponent, how this defect density scales with the quench rate, we find an exponent which within errors is compatible, so 1.09 to 1.2. And if we compare this to the theoretical calculation, okay, mean field would predict an exponent of one for this inhomogeneous kibizuric mechanism. Uh, if we consider the superfluid transition or BC transition uh, to fall into the model F of Hohenberg and Halperin, which is the um, superfluid helium transition, we would expect an exponent of 7.6. And I would say we can say in the experiment at least suggests that we see scaling beyond mean field exponents. Uh, one important thing here is that at this very last quench rate, RQ equals 25, we're actually quenching the system almost instantaneously. So uh, for me, it's still a little bit an open question if Kibizurek would even be applicable here if you basically instantaneously quench over the phase transition. Um, we're definitely about an order of 100, so two orders of magnitude faster than any previous experiments. This is also why we get a very, very large defect density. So this brings us actually into the second part. I think I'm not doing so good on time. Um, how we reach the far from equilibrium regime so if we look at these very fast quenches, um, so we have a very strong overpopulation of high momenta, and the very high density of defects actually leads to a deformation of the solitons. So if we look at the width um, for slow quenches, so the black would be the equilibrium or expected width of a soliton. Um, okay, it falls within the arrow bars, but here more experiments are needed. But for faster quenches, we definitely see that we get solitons which are deformed is actually that the density of defects is so high that they need to be compressed to actually fit into the system. And this is how we now reach the far from equilibrium regime. And as I said here, this breathing amplitude is suppressed. So uh, this helps in the analysis since we can look at the full time evolution. This is now one, up to one second. Uh, we have these generalized solitonic states. We have compressibility. And if you look at the momentum distribution, you can see the buildup of a condensate, which is peak at zero momentum. And so this suggests we have some transport towards the infrared. So we did the comparison of the random defect model to quasi-condensate. So at early times, these quasi-condensates are thermal fit with transversely excited states, which is the dashed line, uh, can absolutely not describe the system. Uh, our random defect model captures the fit very well, 
Whereas for late times at one second, we see that the system is nicely thermalized and the random defect model actually doesn't fit anymore. So, okay. So this brings us to non-thermal fixed points uh, for the ones of you that were in the session last, in the symposium last Tuesday. Um, so non-thermal fixed points describe this transport of particles to the infrared. So in the theoretical papers, and there's too many to list right now, right now, um, usually start with this largely overoccupied state, which has at the characteristic scale of the system, which could be, for example, one over diluteness, uh, has a large occupation such that even though the system might be weakly interacting, so the interaction constant is small, uh, the system becomes effectively strongly interacting. And um, this is the usual way. You then start with this far from equilibrium initial conditions. You quickly approach the so-called non-thermal fixed point solution, which was introduced by Jürgen Berges and Thomas Kassenzer, where the system, independent of its initial conditions, follows a universal scaling law with exponents alpha, beta, and a universal function fs. And here, the system critically slows down, and then at some later time, actually approaches at some point, or is expected to approach thermal equilibrium. So this has been observed now in a couple of systems of scaling evolution. And uh, this, what I'm telling you about, is one of these experiments. So a little bit more to this fixed point. What happens, uh, you usually calculate in kinetic theory. So you get a collision integral. And one important point about this non-thermal fixed point is there's that the effective coupling now becomes strongly renormalized. It becomes momentum dependent, which leads to new scaling solutions of the kinetic Boltzmann equation. So uh, you can then insert the scaling ansatz and look for exponents. And uh, in the perturbative exponents, you find the usual negative ones, which describe energy transport to the ultraviolet. But due to the scaling of this effective coupling, you now find new exponents with a positive sign and these exactly describe this inverse particle transport towards the infrared. Okay. Now, can we see this in the system? So, uh, simply following the scaling ansatz, uh, we look at our momentum distribution in the infrared, and uh, here time goes from blue to red, and you can already see that you have uh, this typical shift of the momentum distribution, which is shifted to lower momenta, and builds up a condensate. Now, if we insert the scaling ansatz, and I'm going to tell you how we calculate this exponent in the next slide, uh, we can actually take some reference time, any reference time, within here from blue to red. And if we now scale our momentum and momentum distribution, we can collapse all of the evolution to a single curve. So this is an enormous reduction of the complexity of the system because, uh, as you can see, end of k and t, there is not necessarily any relation between k and t. And here, uh, we can see that it actually just depends on the product. Now, how do we calculate this? Uh, so we calculate the maximum likelihood function. And uh, we can see that we have a nice clear defined peak here at alpha equals beta equals 0.1 and delta alpha beta, so the error of their difference is relatively small, which is expected since beta is, um, in general, alpha times d due to particle conservation. Um, we can do this for once uh, as predicted by theory. This is independent of the reference time, so we can pick any time t naught within the scaling region. We can collapse all curves onto this curve at a specific time and see that we get consistent exponents. Um, to have a little bit more insight into for which times the scaling actually works, we can also look at the moments of the distribution. So for one, it's the particle number within the scaling region, okay. um, which if it's properly defined, so you can see there's a now time dependent uh, integration limits, uh, scales with this difference between delta alpha beta and the higher moments, which would be, for example, mean momentum, mean absolute momentum or kinetic energy uh, scale with n times beta. And we can see that these particles in the scaling region 
during the scaling period, which is gray, are nicely conserved. And this is now uh, another hallmark of these non-thermal fixed points, which is this emergent conserved quantity, which is self-similarly transported into the infrared. Um, similarly, if we look at the mean energy, so the M2, we can see that it nicely scales in this scaling region. And what this tells us is that the energy in the scaling region actually decreases. So this is direct energy transport towards the, infra, uh, towards the UV. So we get this bidirectional transport of an inverse particle cascade towards the infrared and a direct energy transport towards the UV, even though we couldn't see this directly in the experiment by looking at high momentum. Uh, even more, if you paid attention, you might have noticed that the error bounds changed on the exponents. Uh, this is because the last, in the last slide, I showed you actually three different experiments that were all averaged and all showed the same exponent. Uh, this is another point of these non-thermal fixed points, which state that for varying initial conditions, you might have some transient regime flowing towards the fixed point, but then you have a very efficient loss of information about the uh, initial state long before the system uh, knows anything about thermal equilibrium. And you can actually collapse all of the different initial states. So here you see the initial states in the unrescaled momentum distribution uh, to a single universal curve. So they're all, this is now a time evolution of three different experiments with three different initial conditions which for the full time evolution and uh, uh, consistent exponents of alpha beta equals 0.1 collapse to this universal function. And if we take this ansatz, which can be shown to be a good ansatz in, in higher dimensions, um, we get an exponent for this universal function, which is around 2.4. So if we compare this now to theory, so most of the theoretical calculations are done in higher dimensions where you have predictions of the theta being d plus one and beta being universally one half with alpha equals d times beta if we have particle conservation. Uh, and d equals one is a little bit special since kinematic restrictions would actually say there cannot be any transport. So we would expect beta to be zero. And this is actually also what we see in numerical simulations. However, uh, what we have in the experiment is, um, so if we look at the final state, we have about 10% of the atoms in transversally excited states. So we start with a very small seed in the transverse excited states. These break integrability and drive the system away from 1D regime. And now the question here is, is also, is there a continuous connection, possibly with fractal dimensions, of fixed points between 1D and 2D, which could explain our very, very small uh, scaling exponents. And there's been some first work done by Kreista and Zahra and Berges who just looked at numerical simulations in a dimensional crossover and saw a very sharp transition of these exponents. So some more work here is needed. Uh, then just quickly to leaving the fixed point, um, I talked about isolated systems and relaxation. The problem is at long time scales, experiments usually tend not to be isolated anymore. So uh, for complete thermalization in our system, in this case was probably driven first by transversely excited states and at late times mainly by atom loss. So you can see here in green is the atom loss and about the time where we hit like 10% of atom loss, uh, the system quickly starts to thermalize and we deviate from this non-thermal fixed point scaling solution, uh, which is just beyond the theory what it describes. Um, if we compare it to this random defect model over all times, we see that uh, for early times and in the scaling region, this random defect model is heavily favored. And for late times, we then favor the quasi condensate. And if we look at the scaling now of the defect density, we find more or less compatible exponent, given the fact that there's so many approximations going into this random defect model, it's not that bad. So the question is here, what is the role of this deformed defects? And is there a connection to, for example, coarsening dynamics for defects dominated non thermal fixed points? Okay, so one last slide. Uh, very preliminary results. This was uh, old data that Group Wei Wu, who is now in the, the group of Jörg Schmiedmeier, uh, looked at. So this is now helium star condensation in also a very elongated trap, but here we're in the 3D regime. 
And this was done in the group of Professor Andrew Truscott from Australia. And what they do is, so, a uh, very similar cooling quench sequence. So they initialize the system above the critical temperature, let it thermalize, uh, then quickly ramp down the trap depth so that high energy atoms leave the trap. Although I have to say here, uh, there's still about 20 radially excited states uh, trapped in the system. So it's not really a 1D system. Uh, and then another difference, they leave the trap lowered. So it's very much an open system um, where then the, system, the, the gas is held until it thermalizes. Uh, it's also measured in time of flight here with a very long time of flight, 460 milliseconds, uh, with this delay line detector, which also has single atom, uh, can also do single atom measurements, but with a little bit lower efficiency. And uh, what we can see now here, you see the full momentum distributions. So we see we start with basically no condensate and a very large thermal fraction. And after one second, we have the usual bimodal fit that we have a small thermal fraction and a large condensate. Now, okay, here it becomes a little bit uh, very different. So what we do now is we, for each time we determine the condensate fraction by this bimodal fit, then we normalize the condensate fraction to one or to the same atom number, and we look at its evolution. And what we see, if again, if we look at the scaling ansatz, we can collapse the whole evolution to a single curve. Uh, we now find, uh, again, uh, exponents alpha is approximately beta, uh, with a beta which is now 0.67, and also fairly independent of the, the time, um, so this, this reference time we, we collapse all, all curves on. However, I wanna say uh, that this system might be very, very different from the one I showed you before, especially if you look at the time scales. Uh, this is now really about uh, 600 milliseconds, which uh, should, and differences between different time sets are on the order of 100 milliseconds. So this might suggest that what we're looking at here is more equilibrium physics, that the system actually thermalizes in between. And what we see is uh, the decreasing temperature which then relates to uh, a scaling of the condensate fraction. And this might be, this beta we find might be related to the model F critical exponents in thermal equilibrium. Okay, and with this, I wanna thank you and thank uh, the main collaborators on this work. So Jürgen Berges, Thomas Gazenzer from Theory in Heidelberg, Robert Bücker who did a lot of the experiments, and Jörg Schmidtmeier and the whole Attenship group. Okay, thank you. Time for questions. Maybe just a quick question. So when you compare with theory with experiment and this Kibble-Zurek scaling, in how many dimensions is the theory? Is that? It's 1D. But I mean, what does model F mean in 1D? Does that even make oh, sense? Oh, no, sorry. Uh, it's, uh, the, the transition is 3D. So model F would be 3D. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, I mean, that, that's another, that's a very good question. So uh, the problem is that we here probably, we, we quench over the phase transition in 3D and we, we rapidly quench the system from 3D to 1D. So there's, there's open questions, but uh, the model F exponent I showed was actually then for, uh, three-dimensional gas that we say the phase transition is actually 3D. Uh, David, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, for those experiments and the uh, kibble zerg scaling, were the experiments also 10% out of 1D or were they 1D? I mean, that is that thermalization was normally occurring in 1D, right? Uh, no. So, uh, you said the original population transverse population is very low and the kibizurek experiments i mean the time scales are are like 25 milliseconds as compared to uh one second so the 10 percent uh radially excited states was uh, was at the fastest quench rate 
after one second of evolution. So right after the quench, when we analyze the system, so within the first 10, 50 milliseconds, uh, radially excited states are practically empty. I see. So, so, I mean, if that's the case early on, are you saying that the radial excited states are not important for the evolution? Uh, for the short time evolution. So we mm -hmm. probably have a, a very small, so we expect we have a very small seed of, of radially excited states, uh, which then lead in the long term evolution to thermalization. So this, this is the, the current current understanding. But uh, at early times, um, the system is, is very much 1D. Okay, yeah, I can't actually see what, the, what you're showing now, but I, I okay. take your word for it. Sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, I can also say, I mean, uh, we try to do the scaling analysis for, for these slow quench rates. Uh, which actually is a problem because of this breathing excitation, which uh, makes the scaling analysis uh, rather challenging. Um, but preliminary results would should suggest that actually this transport vanishes for slower quenches, which would indicate that we're for slower quench rates actually go more towards the 1D regime where we expect this transport to vanish even in the intermediate evolution. Okay, thanks. Um, so actually, I do have a question. So uh, the quenches can be as slow or fast, but uh, are there uh, deep quenches or shallow quenches? Uh, sorry, I didn't get the, the quench. Is it a sh deep quench in the sense that you're changing uh, some parameter by uh, a finite factor, or is it a shallow quench, but it can be slow or fast? I'm asking because you're saying that even for fast quenches, you see uh, keep a zerk. I'm wondering if you're staying near the critical point, and that's why that even for fast quenches, you see a Kibozoic dynamics. Okay, so, um, I mean, I can say, so the final temperature we end up with in these fast quenches are, is, is, is about 100 nanokelvin after one second, so I think we're, we, we quench relatively far from the critical point, would be my suggestion. So then the emergence of Kibazoic is really surprising, right? So for me, it's, uh, it's, it's surprising that it's that stable, since there's a lot of things like, for example, we quench from, from 3D to 1D, uh, we quench very fast. Um, and due to the fact that we can measure immediately after the quench, uh, we actually still see Kibazoic scaling. It's also, um, given the fact that I said before, so for slower quenches, we, it, it, it looks like this, this transport, so decay of solitons, if you want to call it this, um, vanishes or becomes very, very slow. Whereas it, for the fast quenches, we see this, this power law scaling. Um, actually also tells you that if, if you would now put in a waiting time, uh, it might obstruct Kibizurik scaling um, that you measure because the defect density will then definitely not just, just decrease independent of the quench rate. So in this sense, uh, it was surprising for us. And I think, uh, so at least for me, it, it was not clear that, that Kibizurek could hold for, for this fast of a quench. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, I guess I had a little follow-up question. It's just that uh, in this range, like for this picture, uh, you're saying that it actually passes over to to forming a condensate while it's still a completely 1D system. Is that is that what the those figures are showing? Um, okay, so the the evolution I showed always starts here at t equals zero, right? And um, but what I'm saying sort of like before t equals zero, before there's a so t equals zero, that's a condensate already, or, or you know, it's a quasi condensate, or it's not. I would say it's it's a defect dominated quasi condensate. So okay, I mean, and, and then, 
So it, it would relate to that, that the exponents that we find is actually for, for 3D, which then would suggest that, that the transition happens somewhere here. And right. if we quench the system to 1D, um, but then get this, this uncorrelated patches where the order parameter pick the face. And this then gives you uh, this non-equilibrium distribution here, which is dominated by solitonic defects. And which don't really go away when it's uh, you do the slow quench. Exactly. So at, at least it looks like they, they don't go away. Right. So when, then you know, presumably it's possible then when you do the large quench and they do go away, it's because you have this transverse excitation. Yes. So there was, uh, if I... So this uh, explaining this small exponent. So um, if, if, for example, if you do numerics and um, so don't do a cooling quench, but just start with like an overpopulation or start with, with a state that we think happens here, which would be solitons, which are very, very tightly packed. Uh, what happens if you look at, at 1D simulations at the momentum distribution is the momentum distribution is, is just invariant because uh, there's no transport in 1D. It's, it's, it's an integrable system in this set. Um, so what happens is these solitons deform in real space, but send out a lot of, a lot of other excitations, um, but leaving the momentum distribution invariant. So uh, it's a little bit uh, this question of, of how, what you want to call these deformed solitons that we find. Uh, where is it? Um, so this one here. So it's not for the fastest quenches. It's 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 not a clearly defined soliton that 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 you can analytically write down, but uh, the solitons get actually deformed, which would be that that you actually quench the system so fast that uh, the the coherent patches are are so small that if now the soliton forms, it it cannot go to its equilibrium width. And this is actually still visible in the momentum distribution. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Let's uh, thank the speaker and all the speakers of the day. And let's go have dinner. <laughs>